Hello, hello, can you hear me? Um, I was telling just a quick anecdote. I was telling Andy about uh, my love for Lost, my name. Um, I bought my goddaughter a copy and managed to smell, spell her name wrong. So for someone that's personalised that you then send through, um, quite an awkward conversation. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so nine years ago I started this thing called It's Nice That. It was a university project. This is what it, it is today. Um, it's nice that I believe passionately that creative inspiration is for everyone and by championing the most exciting and engaging work online, in print and through our events programme, we want to open it, this world up to the biggest possible audience. For those of you who don't know it, this is what It's Nice That looks like. Um, we believe our kind of point of difference is the tone of voice. It's very difficult with something called It's Nice That not to be too serious. Um, the breadth of uh, discipline that we cover, we cover predominantly graphic design, illustration, photography, but it goes far wider to art, uh, sculpture, film, animation, but also it's the breadth of expertise. It's not just the, the best work coming out of agencies, it's uh, second year illustration students. And nothing is kind of nicer than seeing those two things sat next to each other on the homepage, given the same amount of prominence. Uh, so yeah, that's, it's nice that, so at the moment it's uh, predominantly news articles, uh, work which is uh, project focused and then in-depth features, uh, and then some numbers um, to show scale. So we used to talk about users, but then I think people realised that it was only media companies and drug dealers who referred to their people as users. <laughs> so we now talk about reach, and it also means you can add up a whole load of things and you look bigger than you probably are. So our reach is over a million people a month, but that's split into those um, categories and there's probably a a large amount of overlap within those. The team that makes it happen today, we've got a team of six on the editorial team, three on the creative, uh, four project managers. We also run a creative agency. So myself and Alex, my business partner, both studied graphic design, and we've always run It's Nice That and a, and a kind of creative agency alongside each other. The creative agency, some of you might know as INT Works, it's going through a name change to become Anyways, and that's split half and half project managers and producers uh, and creatives, and then we have a bit of studio function. Um, so that's us um, today. This is where it all started. So in the start of 2007, this was the brief put to us at uni to put something in the public domain to make people feel better about themselves. The word domain for me has always had connotations with online, uh, and I don't know what makes people feel better about themselves and going, hey, this is nice, look at this. Um, and it was a university project. Version 1 is what it is. Um, our old editor-in-chief used to absolutely rip it out of me because when we first started, I'm no journalist. Um, you'll tell by the way I speak, and if you ever ask me to spell anything, I'm not good with words. It was an image. It was, the headline was the name of the person. It was one or two sentences. And he, Rob, who's a very good friend of mine who came in to be editor-in-chief, used to find these articles. And I think his best was, was a three-word one, which was literally, this is nice and linked you off. But it, 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 it was that emphasis on, like, there's something about this. We're not saying it's the greatest. We're not saying it's um, the best work. We're saying there is something in this. It's that second glance. It's that there's something here. Um, go and check it out if you're interested. We've grown very organically. We've, we've worked in, I think it's, we've worked out it's like nine studios now. I left and got a job as a, a junior graphic designer in a very traditional um, uh, a graphic design studio. Alex went and worked as a producer for an illustration collective. But we grew. We kind of took small steps. We've never borrowed any money. We've never taken loans. Um, Alex and I own it outright. Um, and this is kind of over. So we're nine years now. And it's, it's funny because we're now reaching this point of kind of maturity. I used to come and talk about building It's Nice That and kind of be this 25-year-old who didn't really know what he was doing. And it was like, wow, this is all going on. And actually now talking about it's nice that it's like actually it's, it's much more established. It's actually we're, we're running a, a kind of proper business. Um, so this is, this is where we're at. This is the studio. Um, so been here all day listening to great speakers. And when I think about what I attribute a whole load of it's nice that success to, it's luck. It's luck is the grand kind of summation of how did we get to do what we do? Luck. That really... Subjective thing. So, if we remind ourselves what the internet looked like in 2007, Tom, good old Tom, actually very funny on Twitter if you follow him. He's, he finds people and puts them down. Um, but when we launched, um, Twitter is about a year old, and I think it had about 20,000 users at the point. Tumblr, two months old. 
The iPhone is two months away from being launched. Instagram, three years away. Um, when I was writing this, I thought, weird, Twitter existed before the iPhone. That's a little nugget for you. Um, <laughs> uh, also, on the topic of luck, everyone's favorite, Google Analytics. This is when we launched. This is what it looked like. There was no one looking at it. That was kind of the point. It was a university project, but luck was that in 2007, it was easier to build the thing than to do a whole load of mock-ups and present mock-ups as to how this thing might look. So it was affordable um, to get a, a CMS uh, back-end, to get a guy in the year below um, to go, hey, you know a little bit about coding. Do you fancy doing this? And he was. Um, there weren't that many people doing it. There were probably kind of four or five other blogs, again, a word that in 2007 everyone really embraced. You can't be a blog now, you've got to be a media company. Um, but there weren't that many people doing it, so there wasn't that much competition. And I attribute loads of it's nice, it's early success down to consistency. When you went on there every day, there would be two things first thing, two things in the, in, at midday. So you knew that if you keep, kept coming back to it, there would be new stuff. It's also a time that a lot of the kind of traditional um, competition, so the things that we were being told to look at while at university, were still trying to get to grips with being online. So again, it's like you're, you're thrown into this and it's a very level playing field. Everyone's trying to find their feet at the same time. Um, but fundamentally, I think one of the things that we sometimes forget to say is the biggest bit of luck was the stuff that we were chucking up on this website, people liked looking at. And I think if it wasn't for that, it's nice that it would have died very quickly. It would have been something that got shown at the Grease show and then kind of petered out. But it gathered momentum. More and more people looked at it. And I think that is... Sometimes we kind of take that for granted. So we run this thing. We have this thing called It's Nice That. We're, we're putting content up all the time. Also, 2007, 12 months before a uh, big recession, a big kind of change in industry where people were being laid off. If I hadn't handed my notes in at the job that I was working in, I'd probably been made redundant um, within six months. But it meant that there were, there were agencies and brands who were looking for more flexible ways of doing the work that they wanted to do. They didn't want to go and pay huge agency fees when they could find alternative ways of doing it. And again, by running It's Nice That, we started to get invited to stuff. So we got invited out to Paris for an exhibition uh, that Nike were putting on. So we merrily, I mean, anyone, I think this was maybe 2008, 2009, um, anyone that offers you a free trip to Paris at that point was like, yes, of course, why wouldn't you? So we jumped on Eurostar with uh, the guys from Nike, had real good FaceTime with them, spoke to them, explained what it was that we were doing. And the one guy was like, well, you know all these creative people. We're always looking at kind of commissioning and telling stories um, visually. Why don't we, like, you could commission those people. And I think Alex and I were there kind of both at the same time kind of going, yes, we could work with you and we could do this. It wasn't us kind of, this wasn't like... Um, and you'll probably work this out by the end of the 20 minutes. There's no great like, business acumen here. It wasn't like, right, we're going to Paris with Nike. We're going to hard sell. We've got a, an hour-long Eurostar. They're not going to know what's hit them. It was like, hey, yeah, we do this thing. Uh, it's called It's Nice That. We showcase great creative work. But it was, I think, again, we talk a lot now about the difference between relationships and networks. And it is, our business is kind of founded on relationships. It's being able to know who people are, what they're up to, what they want to be doing. Um, so Nike actually became one of our first clients. There's also this quote, which I love, which is 100% of CEOs um, had a first job until now. It's, it's that same thing that back in 2007, um, or around 2007, a lot of um, the big companies that started then, so I'm not putting it's nice that in this bracket, far from it, but Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, Instagram, all started by guys in their 20s. Historically, you had to enter a, a company, and you'd, you'd start off at the very bottom, and you'd work your way up. And suddenly, what the internet did was totally transform the way in which you could start things, build things. Um, the flip side of that, obviously, is you're, you're doing it without that uh, risk. Um, back then, I had no responsibility. I had a girlfriend, had to pay rent on a flat in London, and I had to eat and drink. I've now got two kids, a mortgage, same girlfriend. Um, but it's, like, it's a totally different deal now that if someone said to me, right, go off, do what you, you did again. Um, so paired with luck... And there's a nice quote that pairs luck and the next thing, perspiration, which is um, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Um, but I 
discovered this in the last 12 months, um, and I don't know if anyone's seen the Arnold Schwarzenegger Six Steps to Success. Who knew? I'm, not gonna, I'm only going to play point five, but I urge you <laughs> to go and check it out. Okay, here is number five. And that brings me to rule number five, which is the most important rule of, world, of all. Work your butt off. <laughs> and I've always believed leaving no stone unturned. Muhammad Ali, one of my great heroes, had a great line in the 70s when he was asked, how many sit-ups do you do? He said, I don't count my sit-ups. I only start counting when it starts hurting. When I feel pain, that's when I start counting because that's when it really counts. That's what makes you a champion. That's the way it is with everything. No pain, no gain. And let me tell you, it is important to have fun in life, of course. But when you're out there partying, horsing around, someone out there at the same time is working hard. Someone is getting smarter and someone is winning. Just remember that. But if you want to win, there's absolutely no way around hard, hard work. None of my rules, by the way, of success will work unless you do. I've always figured out that there's 24 hours a day. You sleep six hours. They have 18 hours left. Now, I know there's some of you out there now and says, well, wait a minute, I sleep eight hours or nine hours. Well, then just sleep faster, I would recommend. <laughs> just remember, you can't climb the ladder of success with your hands in the pocket. I love everything about that video, like the, the subtitles, the evocative imagery, the soundtrack. It's like, honestly, the other five. There's one where it's like, uh, I'm working out whether or not to do the accent or not, which is ignore the naysayers, um, and it's, it is great. Do check it out. Um, but I don't know. There's no better replacement for raw talent than just working hard. I don't know anyone that ever worked really hard at something and never got something out of it. I, that, I don't know. I just don't believe those people exist. So... When Alex and I first started, so we ran this agency next to It's Nice Out. So It's Nice Out for a long time was uh, before work, after work, evenings, weekends. Evenings and after work are the same thing. Um, and I, I worked this out recently that I reckon we did kind of two, three hours extra um, a day within a working day. And again, I was young. I don't think I'd do this now. But I think it, it helped in where we got to where we got to. So even when we stopped doing the, when It's Nice Out became the day-to-day, -day, we still worked those hours. We'd still typically kind of get in at 7, 7.30, and work through to kind of 7.30, 8-ish. We were never ones to stay super late, but we'd always start early. And when you do the maths of two hours extra a day is 10 hours extra a week, 40 hours extra a month, um, 480 extra hours a year, which is the equivalent of 60 days, so an extra two months. And I do think that hard work, and again, this isn't um, rocket science to go, hey, yeah, just work hard. But it is like, it is such a... It's such an influence on us, and I think it's what we kind of look for in people that come and work with us. So, this is the best picture I've found to represent the ongoing feeling of running a business. <laughs> kind of cling on, hold tight, and enjoy it. Um, little fact, it's called mutton busting, and it's what they do at the rodeo out in the US. So, obviously, the guys get on the, the bulls. Outside the arena, they just strap kids to sheep <laughs> and let them go. I've got two little boys, and they are definitely doing this when they're older. Um, but yeah, so we start this thing out of uni, it's not that thing where you work your way up a company and get introduced to loads of stuff, um, and I wrote a quick list of, of just the things that sprung to mind immediately that we've kind of had to deal with um, and get right, so pitching, invoicing, decks, creds, recruitment, P&L, VAT returns, lawyers, procurement, staff grievances, pay review, business plans, purpose values, senior management teams, paternity policies, HR support, and that list just goes on, that's just me just quickly going, right, I want to demonstrate all those things that we have to deal with. And the truth is, you don't kind of, and I think for the right reasons, you don't get taught this stuff. They don't sit you down at uni and go, right, you're studying graphic design, but there's a chance you might run a business. Let's go through all this stuff. It doesn't happen, and it'd be very difficult to identify exactly the things relevant for each of those people. And sometimes it is really, really difficult, and it's really difficult when things go wrong. And I'm a big believer in the people that we employ, and there is, I'm sure there's a, a better quote than I'm going to try and articulate it now, which is like, you don't judge people when things are going really well. You, you judge those people when things go really badly. That's when I think people's honest um, reaction and involvement and energy actually come through. So to give you an example, we started working with Nike. Um, very early on, we got commissioned to do a few sculptures. And part of, again, the way in which we work is utilising all those relationships that we've made through. It's nice that to commission those people to produce the work. We, will, we tend to art direct um, and manage the production of those things. 
um, we'd commissioned the sculptor, and as it got nearer to delivery, it became quite apparent that the way in which he was 3D printing it actually wasn't possible at the time. And it's kind of like, shit, this is, a, this is a client and a job that we're kind of banking on to pay rent, to pay our wages, to kind of make sure everything ticks over. And you kind of look, and, and I think, again, it's, it's one of the massive benefits we've, we've had is reaching out to the right people and seeking that advice and actually being very open and honest about going, look, we don't know the answer here. This is, we don't really know what to do. But through talking to a few people that we trusted, Alex got on the phone to the client and said, look, I want to meet you first thing. Um, I want to take you through where we're currently at. Met him in person, very open and honest. This is what's happened. This is what we're going to do to try and rectify it. Um, and, uh, and here it is. The, these, these are the options. This is what we suggest. And fortunately, the client totally respected that, was very kind of straight with us and said, look, it's not great, but I love that you've got a solution. I love that there's still going to be something in the space when various people from um, management come and see that thing. So he's still a client, and we've just finished this year. In the last year, we finished projects in Shanghai, Tokyo, and Paris with that same client. And it could have all come to a, a pretty nasty end that we'd have never worked with them before. And you can't read about that stuff in books and kind of trying to learn that stuff, you have to just kind of live through it and that's what we've, we've tried to do. So as we've, um, as we've grown, I really like this quote, which is, I think the first bit is how we used to behave and I think the second bit is how we now behave, which is um, not just rushing into things and being like, the, the youthful exuberance I think only lasts so long and I think actually kind of experience starts to take over. We plan better, we make better decisions. Um, I'm going to talk, I've only got a few minutes left and I'm uh, this has kind of cropped up a few times today, which is kind of reassuring. Um, and the way in which we've built it into what it is today. Uh, purpose is one of those things, purpose and values. And I'm not necessarily going to talk specifically about our purpose and values, but I'm going to talk about the role in which I think they play in businesses in 2016. And I think the big difference is, is businesses in 2016, I think people, people want to feel like they're doing something that matters. And I think our responsibility as people that own the business and run the business is be very open about what it is that we're trying to do. And we, we introduced a purpose a while ago, and then it just, it's one of those things that is, is bad. It just kind of lives on a server, and people kind of, kind of can give you a, a meaning of what they think it is. But it's, you, ask, you poll everyone, and they give you quite different answers. Um, but it's being honest with why you, you exist. There's, there's a great um, story that I got told, which is when in the past, when you used to go to company's house to register a business, you had to talk about your purpose and why you existed. And if Companies House didn't kind of see a point in your business existing, they wouldn't let you have a business. Whereas now it's just like, right, this is, this is the name, this is what we're doing, let's go. Um, but I love the idea that you have to have a purpose in order to justify having a business. Um, so we do have the group, so Alex and I own the Hudson Beck Group, which in turn owns, uh, it's nice that in any ways. And someone said it earlier, I can't remember who, it is that North Star, it is that guiding light. And the same with the values I don't want to talk specifically about our values. And they're not something that you kind of come to work and quiz people on and go, hey, name our five values and, hey, how are you using them today? But it is that thing as to as and when things aren't quite going right, you get to kind of, you get to reference and they actually help and they sometimes identify when someone isn't right for the business or for other things. And they, they do hold a real purpose. The, the challenge that we have now is getting the guys to kind of work out how they live and how we, we celebrate and use them. Um, I'm quickly running out of time. Um, so with all that kind of contributing towards is uh, autonomy and responsibility, and I don't think it has been for a long time, but it's nice that isn't the Will and Alex show. It's not me and Alex kind of going, right, I'm making this decision, you're making that decision. What we identify is we want to grow something, we want to grow something, we want to be involved in something for the rest of our life. This isn't a quick thing that we just want to sell, get a payday and go and do something else. So in order to do that, we're, we're trying to grow a team that, can take on that autonomy. And autonomy is one of the most difficult things to hand over. It's also really difficult to hand over the thing that you've brought into the world and go, hey, there you go, do with it what you want. But with the purpose, with the values, with where we've come from, actually, intelligent people can kind of work that out and they make pretty good calls. Um, which gives Alex and myself the opportunity to work on the business, not in the business. Um, and then it's this, which I think when we talk about that group, one of the big advantages that we have in, in having 30 people in that room is the editorial team isn't six people. It's 30 people who are aware of everything that's going on that feed into that team. The creative team isn't seven people on the agency. It's 30 people. When we're commissioning, we just commissioned 24 illustrators to do 24 stickers for Google for a new messaging app. 
It's 30 people feeding into that conversation, highlighting who the people are that they think might be right for it. And it's that far wider network. So we get to operate much bigger than we actually appear. Um, I'm out of time. I'm just going to finish on saying all of that, so me stepping further away, has allowed me to work on something new, which is called Lecture in Progress, which launches next Monday as a Kickstarter campaign. Lecture in Progress is born out of this awareness that actually, as we've kind of grown um, up in the creative industry, education I don't think has really changed. I've gone and done days at various universities, and it still feels like it did 10 years ago. And actually, I think the industry has changed loads. So Lecture in Progress... Um, essentially is aiming to inspire and inform the next generation of creatives to make better career decisions. Um, and I've spent the last nine months working on this. So uh, in nine, in, what am I saying? A week on Monday is when you're going to find out more. And the very last thing that I wanted to, this is the last slide, I promise, um, is this thing from Roald Dahl. And I don't know that it's definitely from Roald Dahl, but I found it on the internet a while ago. And it is that, it's that thing that I remind myself of when I'm kind of not sure I want to go into work and stuff. And it is that. I think enthusiasm and being interested in something is absolutely paramount. And if you're not interested in enthusiasm, in the thing that you go to work to do day to day, 2016, there's an opportunity to change that stuff. There wasn't always. Um, and yeah, lukewarm is no good. Thank you very much.